All right, can you see this okay? Yep, looks great. All right. So hi everyone, my name is Lana, and I'm, today I'm gonna to be presenting you my project entitled Comparing the Biodegradability of Petroleum-Based Plastic with a Novel Sustainable Bioplastic Alternative. So plastic accumulates at a rate of 8 million metric tons each year. And besides acting as endocrine disruptors and also toxins to thousands of marine species and also terrestrial species, it also faces, we also face huge challenges with the disposal methods. So landfill usage, incineration, and uh, marine dumping all contribute to air pollution, water contamination, and the production of toxic residue. So one of the leading solutions to this problem is the usage of biodegradable plastics and also bioplastics, which are substitutes that have at least 20% of their materials um, considered renewable. However, biodegradable plastics don't exactly break down into non-toxic substances. They only break down into smaller pieces of what they originally were. And bioplastics are primarily made of corn, cassava, and other food starches. But is it the best idea to divert a large portion of our food production to such a huge industry? In that case, we'd be facing um, huge amounts of over-fertilization and also genetic modification, which have much more severe consequences. So with six years of plastic pollution uh, research in my belt, um, I decided to join the search for a sustainable alternative and I created a bioplastic film using bamboo. Um, it is a very cheap, uh, affordable, and a widespread fast-growing plant um, that has high concentration of tannins in it. So tannins are antifungal and antibacterial uh, molecules that have the ability to form complexes with carbohydrates. So for this research, I needed a carbohydrate to include, so I used crickets. Uh, crickets contain chitin, um, which is a polysaccharide that's found within the walls of, you know, fungi, marine invertebrates, and exoskeletons of insects, including crickets. So these two substances made up the base of my biofilm, um, along with agar-agar, a derivative of seaweed. So I included this as well as glycerin, acetic acid, and distilled water in my film. And that was the first part of my research, was really just creating um, this bioplastic and selecting the best you know, the best constituents. Then the second part involved comparing this bioplastic to current polyethylene films. So in order to select the plastic, I used a grading scale, which considered transparency, strength, and the film's ability to re resist fatigue. So overall, I had 60 different formulas, and I narrowed it down to nine to um, apply this grading scale to, to pick my final formula. And as you can see in the, bot um, the bottom of the slide, I have the final constituents um, and what I actually ended up using. So here's a flow chart basically just demonstrating my overall process. I use a solution casting method and I ran into a few difficulties with like the final film. So these were basically the small just adjusts that I made um, th throughout the project. So if it was too brittle, I would add more glycerin. And then I, I um, addressed if it wouldn't solidify, if it was too rigid um, and et cetera. So the first test that I uh, used for preliminary testing was a tensile strength test that I uh, mimicked in my home. So I used two C clamps and attached it to, to two sides of a uh, dog bone shaped piece of plastic film. And I had a container attached to that. So I added um, water in 100 milliliter increments until the film would break. And then I would measure the weight at which it broke to calculate the amount of force used uh, for that the film could withstand. And then I assigned each uh, force bracket a score. And that was my grading scale for the strength test. So then I repeated this for the transparency testing. Um, though this isn't a mechanical property and it isn't as important, it's still something to consider when trying to create an aesthetically pleasing uh, product that's on the market. So I use UV spectrometry to determine the transmittance of light through each film. And again, I have my grading scale here. And then finally was the fatigue test. So I used, um, I performed uh, bilateral 90 degree flexes in series, uh, two of which constituted a cycle. And um, this was important because I wanted to see if the film could withstand continuous use because um, it was no use if it was cracking and breaking after only like going through 20 cycles, say. So it was generally considered good if it exceeded 100 cycles. And again, you can see that in the grading scale. So here's my final uh, table showing the nine final concentrations of the fi final nine films and also their total uh, point scale. So. I added the amount of points earned by each film through the three preliminary tests to get their total score. 
And as you can see, trial nine received the highest total score, uh, which is why it was the final bio class. So next up was the biodegradation test. So I took 20 to 24 silicate test tubes and I filled them with eight grams of simulated landfill soil that I created, as well as um, uh, 10 milligram samples of each type of film, of, of each film. So the uh, polyethylene uh, film, which is a common, uh, commonly used in plastic bags, and then my bioplastic film. So these were incubated at 168, uh, for, for 168 hours, and I had an additional 0.5 milliliters of distilled water added uh, just to maintain moisture, make sure that, that um, the soil was not sterilized and that biodegradation would take place. Then a water absorption test was, was carried out I'm using a similar method, but instead of using soil, water was, was added, about eight milliliters, and the strips were exposed to the water for either one, five, 15, 30, or 60 minutes. So basically what these two tests were, they're trying to mimic uh, actual uh, biodegradation or disposal that would take place in the environment. Because really the sh uh, plastic can only go, it can go one of two ways. It can be sitting on land or in the water. So I really wanted to see what uh, would happen in those two scenarios with my novel bioplastic. And then finally, I performed a solubility test using the remaining solution from the water absorption test. So samples were removed from, uh, after the water absorption test, reweighed to see the amount of water absorbed, and the remaining solution that did, that was colored a bit by the tannins, I was placed into a colorimeter to determine the concentration of tannins and thereby determine uh, the solubility percentage. And I also used an FTIR for the biodegraded samples as well as the solubility samples uh, just to see the difference in weight and calculate it in a more precise manner. So here we have um, the first FTIR spectra and this spectra um, shows, it, it shows the, the absorbance of the film at these different wavelengths. And I what I did is that I compared the peaks of a control, of a control strip that did not have any biodegradation and one that was exposed to the experimental conditions. So determining the ratio between several highlighted peaks, as you see here, uh, told me the biodegradation rate. So the bioplastic sample exhibited 22% biodegradation, while the polyethylene sample had virtually no degradation. And this is mainly because of this sharp peak here seen at around 3000, um, because uh, this represents the carbon bond. There's a carbon-carbon double bond that are um, very closely attached in, in polyethylene and which gives it its indestructible character because it is very hard to break down because it's not naturally found in the environment. So therefore microorganisms don't have the pathways to actually break it down. But in my bioplastic, you see that peak is missing and is replaced with a peak indicating carbon hydrogen bonds. So then I have the FTR spectra of the bioplastic samples after exposure to water. So I used the five, 15 and 60 minute samples for this. And overall, I saw that there was um, significant weight increase and um, solubility in the, in the bioplastic samples. There's about a 200% increase um, in, in weight for the water absorption test and 18% solubility. While in the polyethylene samples, there was virtually no absorption and virtually no solubility as well. So I likely attributed this to, um, to the, the polarity of each of the solutes and the solvents. So in chemistry, there's um, like the saying, like dissolves like. So if a, if a solute is polar, a solvent is polar, then the, so, then the two would be soluble. So the peaks that I, re I saw in the FDR showed that there was hydrogen bonding present in the bioplastic, which is a polar bond. And water is a polar solvent, so therefore I concluded that it was reasonable to assume that my bioplastic would be soluble, whereas the polyethylene was not. So finally, I conducted a cost analysis on, um, on between my plastic and polyethylene plastic. So overall, I found that there was a difference of about two tenths of a penny between uh, polyethylene and bioplastic. And in this, I only considered the main constituents of each Film. So for polyethylene, I considered the cost of petroleum. And for bioplastic, I included the cost of the agar-agar, tannins, and chitin. But then this gap is further closed when you consider the, uh, the cost of landfill maintenance and also recycling in the poly with the polyethylene. So overall, the chitin and tannin bioplastic formula designed in this investigation 
It, dem it definitely demonstrates potential after analyzing its effectiveness and comparing it to the petroleum-based film. And also, it supported the data that I collected did support my hypothesis that the bioplastic does have an enhanced capability to biodegrade. But I, what I didn't expect was this, um, the significant amount of water absorption and solubility. So definitely in the future, um, as I pursue this endeavor, I would like to um, enhance that aspect of it. Um, maybe add a coating or do something to kind of add like a lag phase to the biodegradation and solubility rates. Because optimally a product, you would want a product to kind of um, uh, not immediately break down so it could be used properly, but eventually have a steady decrease in, in weight as it entered the biodegradation phase. So that is the optimal property um, of the plastic, but definitely the cost analysis um, showed that, the, that there is definitely potential for this product to be a serious plastic alternative. So thank you very much for listening and thank you for allowing me to share my research. All right, thank you so much, Lana. Uh, any questions, please place in the chat. And also, just to let you know, everybody, you can place questions in the chat as the person's presenting if, you, if something comes up to you uh, or comes to mind while they're talking too, so you don't have to wait until the very, very end. Any questions for Lana? Uh, Lana, I had one. Do you think um, that your plastic alternative would be good for you know, um, certain kinds of products and maybe not as much for other products? Yes, the way I was looking um, looking at it, it was more so, most, most, more so towards um, um, not so much as food packaging, but more so as like a plastic bag alternative. Gotcha. Um, because the water, solubil uh, the water solubility definitely showed that um, exposure to food and liquid substances aren't the best idea for this plastic at the moment. So it's definitely um, a characteristic I like to enhance, but um, I was definitely looking at it, at, at it as a direct substitute and direct competitor to current uh, plastic bags. Yeah, it looked very pliable and flexible. It was, and I did have a lot of problems with that. Um, it, it was always like cracking and a lot of the samples I had were too brittle. Mm. So altering the amount of glycerin I found was like really the direct factor that influenced its flexibility. Um, so really it was just finding that balance that allowed it to have um, such flexibility, but still solidify and be a solid film. Wow, great, that's so cool. All right, there are still a few more minutes uh, for Lana's uh, time. So any other questions uh, you can place in the chat now. And then I think, Shailen, if you kind of want to come on on board or, or be on deck, I guess you can start with um, uh, sharing your screen. But thank you so much, Lana. That was a great program uh, presentation. Of course, thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. All right, Shailen, you can go ahead and, and start getting set up. I'll keep my eye on the chat just in case if anything else comes up. Okay. Um, I think you can see that. Yep, it looks great. Let me just okay. let me just reset your time. All right. So I don't see any other questions. So Shailen, I think it's safe for you to go ahead and get started. All right. Hi, I'm Shaylin, and this year, or last year, my project was on developing and testing a new de-icing agent that would have minimal impacts on polymonetic species. So um, the objective was to develop and test an environmentally friendly de-icing agent that would have little to no effect on them. So polymonetic species is a genus of shrimp found in estuaries. Um, so like the Barnegat Bay or areas in the Northeast region. And um, I use two specific types of species. I use Polymonetus pallidosis, which is a freshwater species, and they're more active during the winter time. And I also use Polymonetus vulgaris as a species. Um, they are more of a saltwater and brackish water type of shrimp that live in the benthos layer 
of the systems and they like to live in aquatic vegetation. And so my project was based around de-icing agents. So de-icing agents are chemicals or compounds used to remove ice off the surface. Um, that can include calcium chloride, rock salt, any sort of chemical or compound like that and commonly used on roadways and at airports for safer conditions for drivers and pilots. Airport de-icing agents are made up of a more liquid type. And so it's mainly ethylene glycerol and other compounds like that, because ethylene glycerol will have little effect on the metal but there are more marine, uh, there's more impacts to animals from these chemicals, um, not only marine animals, but also land animals. The most common de-icing agent in the United States is rock salt or salt brine, which is used on highways and normal roads by towns. And, um, but most rock salt ends up in drains and streams, increasing the salinity in those areas, which can be toxic to marine animals. Um, and for my de-icing agent, I also use chitin but, and cytosan. Um, it's, chitin is the main component of exoskeletons for arthropods or crustaceans and also crickets. And then cytosan is just a broken down version of that. And then on top of that, I also used acetic acid, which is a weak vinegar acid that can, is used to clean aquariums and can lower the melting point of water. Um, so on top here, this is a picture of the two types of species and their differences. Um, on top is Polymonetus polydosis. They are a little bit larger and have lower salinity rates, but they can still live in salt water, but minimal. And then on the bottom, is Polymonetus vulgaris. They are smaller and have a little more coloring and can live in about 10 to 20 parts per thousand. And this is where they live um, in the United States, so more so near estuarine areas and things like that. Okay, so the development of the de-icing agent. When I was developing the de-icing agent, I wanted to use um, cheaper materials. And so that's how I got to acetic acid because I knew that could get rid of ice. And then I used cytosan because that could keep it on surfaces longer. Um, and so when developing it, I used um, 30 grams of cytosan and one liter of 1% acetic acid. And then on top of that, the grams were measured on analytical balance, so it would be accurate. The mixture was stirred for a very long time to make sure everything was put together, and it was repeated throughout the research to make more and more. The solution was then put into a negative 10 degrees Celsius freezer to ensure that it would withstand freezing temperatures, because if it didn't, it wouldn't really work. Um, and then on top of that, I also made a mixture of that de-icing agent and salt brine just to see which one would be better because um, salt brine is proven to work. So I just wanted to see if it would be better like that. My next part of the project was shrimp mortality. Um, so I used 900 of each type of species, the freshwater and the saltwater and they all came from the same place to ensure they were in the same stage of life. Um, they were separated and put into a course of 36 trials and liquid de-icing agents were utilized. So there was a cytosan acetic acid mixture, a rock salt cytosan acetic acid mixture, ethylene glycol from airports, just to see how airport de-icing agents would compare, and then rock salt brine. Um, each trial had 25 shrimp and data was collected through five days. It was looking at the number of shrimp living and all of the water quality aspects, ammonia, dissolved oxygen, salinity, and especially shrimp reaction to food because that is vital to the life of the shrimp because if they're not eating or if they're acting strange, that can infer that they may die soon. 
another part of it was EIC agents efficiency. And so that was just to see how well it would work. Um, I also did statistical analysis to check these results. Okay, so this is for the de-icing agent efficiency. The control was just a, was just an ice cube. And so there was no mass, but the biggest mass difference was actually shown between the rock salt brine sand acetic acid mixture and the cyanide sand acetic acetic acid mixture. Um, so that proved that those de-icing agents worked better than those, except the ethylene glycol also did work. Um, and then these are just the common aspects of water quality. This is the main part, the mortality of the shrimp. So as you can see here, the shrimp put into ethylene glycol, none of them lived, showing that it was a very toxic liquid mixture, but the shrimp put into the cytosand acetic acid mixture and the cytosand acetic acid rock salt mixture were the most living and also rock salt did leave some and for the saltwater species the rock salt also played a factor because they can have a higher salinity tolerance and so but the cytosand acetic acid mixture and the cytosand acetic acid rock salt mixture still prevailed and left the most living shrimp. Um, these were just the salinity ranges. Um, ethylene glycol actually raised salinity, which can contribute to the death of the shrimp. And then this is the salinity ranges for the saltwater species as well. Ethylene glycol raises salinity again. Um, and here's the main part. This study um, supported that my de-icing agent would have minimal effects on both the shrimp, on both types of shrimp species, and that the sort of sand acetic acid mixture would have um, lowest effects. Um, significant difference was shown between sort of sand acetic acid and rock salt brine trials, and. Yeah, and mass difference values um, vary between rock salt brine and cytosan de-icing agents, more with the cytosan de-icing agents. Um, there were significant effects on both the freshwater and saltwater shrimp put into the ethylene glycol or rock salt contaminated water compared to the acetic acid and cytosan mixture. And it was also shown that the shrimp placed into ethylene glycol or rock salt Canary water had less of an appetite. Um, overall, this research shows that the cytosan acetic acid de-icing agent is friendlier to shrimp species and is more efficient than commonly used de-icing agents. And that is it. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jalen. Uh, we do have a question about how difficult would it be to obtain the cytosan in a larger volume for road de-icing? Um, you can actually, buy, it is able to be bought online. I bought mine off of Amazon and there's companies that sell it in bulk online as well. Have you thought about testing this on other critters? Um, yeah, I have thought of testing it on more vertebrates, but that is also hard to do because it's vertebrates and you have to go through a lot of trials. So I chose shrimp because they're non-vertebrates and they are also a bioindicator species. So it can show how it will affect a different ecosystem. Gotcha. How did you, where did you get all those shrimp? From one I, you said? I ordered them online, actually. <laughs> It was easier than going saning and um, yes. it ensured that they would all be like from the same place. Right. Yeah, that, that's that's a good uh, good point. And I like that the one species you chose was more active in the wintertime. Um, we do have another question. Uh, based on your data, should we consider regulating the amount of ethylene glycol and rock salt used in areas where the fresh where the freshwater shrimp um, are the freshwater shrimp in danger of population decline if de-icing with these products continue without regulation? Um, so 
regulation would be a good thing because a lot of airports do actually have some streams and or are by marshes. Uh, I know Atlantic City Airport is by a marsh. Um, so regulation would be a good thing and it should be regulated. Um, over times of longer use, there could be a decrease in the shrimp population, but right now there is not. But after more and more accumulates in the ecosystem, there most likely would be a decrease in the population. And do you have plans to show local homeowners how to make uh, how to make the alternatives? I have shown a couple people in my community, but I do <clears throat> plan either probably next year to do so. <laughs> Gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, and then someone put, are you ultimately sacrificing crickets to shape, to save shrimp? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually, the cytosan that I used was from recycled exoskeletons of shrimp and crustaceans. So it, it didn't actually kill any animals. It was from the ones that they shut it off. <laughs> mm. Okay. Any other questions? Before we turn, move on to our next presenters, really interesting and really relevant, especially right now in this you know season. And I know it's something that a lot of people are interested in knowing more about. So thank you, Shailen. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Cameron and Juliet, you are up next to discuss the American beach grass study that you've done. Can you see that? Oh, there you go. That all good? Hey, Cameron, uh, I'm not sure if we can hear you yet. Or Juliet, maybe that was Juliet. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. All right, you're all set, go ahead. So, hi, my name is Cameron, and Juliet and I's study looked at the impacts of Amophila brevilegulata on various aspects of dune erosion. So, a brief background on coastal dunes. Coastal sand dunes act as a barrier from harsh weather, preventing flooding and high winds, which are commonly brought on by close proximity to the ocean. These weather conditions naturally erode the dunes carrying the sand away. Erosion during one storm can make the dunes more vulnerable to erosion from storms in the future, but planting dune grass can stabilize the dunes and catch windblown sand, reducing erosion. The plants we used were Amophila brevilegulata, also known as American beach grass or simply Amophila. They're spike-shaped plants that grow to be about two feet tall. Amophila spreads through rhizomes underneath the surface of the dunes, as you can see in the picture on the bottom right. It traps airborne sand with its leaves and then continues to grow up through the dune as it buries itself. And the reason we chose this dune grass is because it's the most commonly planted dune grass on the mid-Atlantic coast. You've probably seen it if you've been to any of the beaches around us. Um, those two pictures on the top are what it looks like. So the purpose of the study was to find a correlation between sand erosion and plant density using several factors, including weight, height, mass, area, and width. The results of the study could help set a precedent on how to plant dune grass in the future to make dune grass plantings more efficient in retaining dune structure and therefore protecting areas further inland. So the bottom left picture is of the boxes with the dune grass growing in them. And then there are two pictures of the wind tunnel. The photo all the way on the right was during one of the wind tunnel trials. So you can see the plants blowing inside of the tunnel. Um, in the middle, those three bags are full of sand that we dump into the wind tunnel before a trial.
Since plants stabilize the dunes, we hypothesize that high density plant configurations would be best to limit wind erosion on the dunes. So basically more plants would be able to limit erosion better. We hypothesize that the boxes with no plants would erode the most and the low density boxes would fall somewhere in the middle of the high density and the nulls. The graphics to the right show how plants help prevent erosion by not only anchoring the sand with their roots, but also trapping airborne grains of sand. Without the plants, more sand is able to get past. The wind tunnel we've been working at is located at the Weartown OCBTS Center. It was built in 2016 as a research tool to explore coastal change. The diagram at the top of the slide shows the main parts of the wind tunnel. Uh, on the far left, the funnel where air is sucked in, and then the long strip of sand, which is the sand bed, a space where boxes with plants can be put, the fan, and then the vent where air is let out. The pictures on the bottom row show uh, on the far left, that's an overview of the side view of the wind tunnel and then also the platform in front of it. And the two on the right are taken from the inside, one looking at the funnel and the other at the fan. These are some more pictures just of the inside of the building where the wind tunnel is located. You can see uh, the platform and also the pallet jack that we use to maneuver the boxes around. Planting occurred on June 16, 2020. Amophila was planted in a staggered configuration in one meter by one meter test boxes at two densities, mimicking the most commonly used spacings in planting efforts. There were nine low density boxes with 18 inch spacings between plants and nine high density boxes with 12 inch spacing. Additionally, there are four null boxes with no plants. So to do each trial, the first thing we did after putting the boxes in the tunnel was leveling the sand bed using a one inch break and then taking a photo of the front face of the plants as you can see in the picture at the top. Uh, we then placed pins vertically in the sand in order to measure the amount of sand lost or gained during the trial. Uh, we had five designated spots in the box where we put each pin. We then measured the initial weight of the box using a, a pallet jack that doubled as a scale and also height of each pin. The boxes were then individually subjected to wind speeds of 12 meters per second for a period of five minutes. Post-test weight and pin height measurements were then taken. And then to find biomass, uh, we cut the plants at the surface and then weighed them by row. They were then placed in a drying oven for three days at, at 70 degrees Celsius. And once the plants came out of the drying oven, they were reloaded. And this picture shows uh, raking the sand bed. And this is what turning on the wind tunnel looks like. Preliminary results. Initial observations of the data show that the high density boxes lost an average of 0 0.67 kilograms of sand, while the low density boxes gained an average of 1.3 kilograms. A paired t-test was performed on the data, which showed that it was statistically significant meaning that if the experiment were to be repeated, you would likely get the same results. This is contrary to what was expected. Theoretically, high density plants should retain more sand and therefore gain more weight. While the high density boxes did have a lower net change, we were looking at lowering the amount of erosion, not the lowest net change in the sand levels. The graph at the top shows the weight in kilograms of sand, either lost or gained, where the blue is the high density boxes, yellow is low density, and the red is the null. The null boxes lost an average of 7.1 kilograms, which shows the obvious difference between when plants were there versus when they were not. There were no significant correlations found on the height measurements taken using the erosion pins. The biomass of high and low densities were statistically significant. The average high density biomass was 73.3 grams, while the average low density biomass was 47.0 grams. 
The graph on the bottom shows this. Boxes one to nine are high density in purple, and boxes 10 to 18 are low density in blue. Interpreting the data, high density plants may have caused more wind turbulence inside the tunnel. This would kick up more sand and therefore lead to an increase in erosion. The height results may have occurred because the sand only piled up around the plants where it was trapped, so it was not evenly dispersed. Also, inaccuracies while we are leveling the sand may account for a possible avenue of error as the areas immediately around the plants had to be leveled by hand. We are still doing additional research on this data to determine why these results occurred because they are contrary to what we expected. Right now, we are looking at frontal area and stem width measurements using Adobe Photoshop and a software called ImageJ. These results are going to show if the size of the plants and the leaf area available to trap sand relates to the erosion levels. Once this data is available, we can run more statistical tests to determine both the significance of the results, uh, and then we can draw conclusions about the validity of the data and what uh, some concrete results are. We would like to thank Dr. Wenick, as well as the Jacques Cousteau National Estuarine Research Reserve for having us today. If anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to answer. All right, thank you guys. Really interesting, that wind tunnel uh, looks so neat. Such a neat contraption there. <laughs> I'm sure it was interesting to work in. Um, we have a question. What recommendations do you have for the method of planting dune grasses after your study? So uh, with the results we've, we have now, uh, it looks like planting them at a lower density would actually be more efficient. But depending on what the results we're working on now show, uh, it could mean that high density is actually more efficient, but we did definitely show that dune grass makes a big improvement in how much sand is retained. All right, any other questions for Cameron and Juliet? Go ahead and enter them into the chat. Nothing so far. I would uh, have to echo. I would expect, um, I was not expecting your results to be that. I would think also that the higher density would um, be more effective. So that's really interesting. All right. I don't see anything coming up. All right. Nicole, I think we'll um, go ahead and turn it over to you now. Are you there, Nicole? Oh, there she is. Hello. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. All right. Do you think you're ready to to do your talk? Yeah. Is it is it working? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Cameron and Juliet. By the way, that was great. Um. So, uh, I'll be ending off with my two year research project. Um. I did measuring the acoustic properties in Pine Lake Park and Sedge Island. So just a little bit of background. Um, sound is a very important aspect of life. Many marine organisms use sound to communicate, uh, navigate, hunt, hide, and basically survive. Um, however, increased noise pollution from man-made activities such as seismic surveying, um, tourism and shipping boats, and marine wind turbines uh, produce excess destructive sounds in the water, forcing certain species to actually change their survival tactics. Um, and so there's been discoveries of many marine animals, such as whales, whose calls are actually masked by these large ships, um, changing the way they call in order to communicate. Um, another example would be seismic surveying, which is the release of shockwaves into the ocean to locate oil. Um, this has shown to cause a two to three fold increase in the mortality of zooplankton. 
And seeing how there's very little regulation to um, control the effects of noise pollution, it's interesting to um, understand how sound varies in different environments um, with different sediment steps and conditions. And so this way, more factors can be considered um, to limit the, the damage of noise pollution and see which environments are most vulnerable to it. So a brief explanation of sound. As sound moves through the medium, the surrounding particles vibrate and create heat um, from the absorbed acoustic energy. And so the absorption of energy causes the sound to travel slower and become quieter. Now, depending on the texture um, absorbing the sound, sound may either be absorbed, um, for example, in porous materials, or it could be reflected um, for uh, more solid surfaces. Uh, so in different environments, other conditions such as increasing water temperature, salinity, and pressure can cause an increase in the speed of sound. A possible way to lessen noise pollution is by looking at sediment's absorption ability, which is affected by the sediment composition. Uh, mud and sand, common bottom sediments, are made up of sand, silt, and clay, each with different properties. Uh, sand, found in estuary bottoms and bays, are more permeable, meaning that water can penetrate easily, um, and as sound travels faster through sand, where less energy is lost. On the other hand, mud, found in salt marshes, consists more of clay and silt, uh, which is more porous, and sound caught in these pores will lose energy faster as it bounces around more frequently. And so, because the characteristics of each sediment are different, they will decrease the amplitude by different amounts. Um, and so, based on previous simulations, um, I, where I basically simulated this experiment from my own bathroom, uh, mud from Sedge Island absorbed more sound at higher frequencies, while um, rough gravel and coastal sand performed better at lower frequencies. I then expanded this testing into the field, where I could determine more accurate results for the varying conditions of actual environments. So I tested at three sites in Sedge Island, a marsh environment visited at the end of summer, and one site from Pine Lake, um, which is a local freshwater, visit, freshwater lake visited at the end of fall. So you can see me um, in the field at Sedge and then at Pine Lake. And so to set up for data collection, I had a waterproof speaker placed at the surface of the water, um, projecting sound at an angle um, to the hydrophone on the bottom sediment, which was one yard away. And a hydrophone is basically an underwater microphone. And so I played a range of frequencies from 100 to 6,000 hertz. And then every 100 to 500 hertz, the amplitude or the volume of the sound was measured along with its frequency or pitch. Uh, a control was tested beforehand to um, subtract from the amplitude measured during testing so that I could um, calculate an amplitude difference. So I also analyzed sediment composition. Um, and so by doing this, um, I collected a 100 grain sample from each site and then dried them and then uh, sieved them through the road tap sieve shaker, which basically separated them by grain size. So you can you see here, there's more finer um, grain sizes and then more like small rocks. Um, I then scaled each of them for its mass and then converted it into percentages, which you can see on the right here. So site one and three, sites one and three had the highest percentage of fine sand, while site two was mostly medium sand and site four was mostly coarse sand. So after testing, I compared the amplitude difference, uh, which was the amplitude measured during testing, subtracted from the control for every frequency, um, and then compared between different testing sites. So for the previous years of research, some similar patterns can be seen. Uh, one being that as frequency increases, uh, the, um, the amplitude difference it also increases. Um, and so this may be due to the fact that at higher frequencies, the sound particles vibrate more and their energy is lost more rapidly. Thus, um, they can't travel as far um, as opposed to lower frequencies. So to the left is a comparison between sites one and two, site two consisting of more medium sand. Um, and site one absorbed less sound compared to site two, consistent with the previous research where it showed that finer grain sizes were better at sound absorption. On the right is a comparison of temperature. Um, and so sites one and site four had an 18.4 degrees Fahrenheit difference, uh, site four with the colder temperature. Um, and this site four showed a greater amplitude difference throughout the frequency range. So as temperature increases, 
the absorption coefficient decreases. Um, so increasing temperature decreases the viscosity and in less viscous mediums, less acoustic energy is absorbed. Thus colder environments seen in the yellow line um, absorb sound better. Um, and in these three graphs, uh, sound absorption was compared based on depth. Um, and so before I mentioned each site was visited twice a week apart and varying depths were mostly due to rainfall in between testing dates. So um, site one had a foot difference in depth, site two had a 1.5 foot difference in depth, and site three had the largest depth difference at 3.5 feet. So you can see that the larger the depth difference, the more of a difference you can see in the sound absorption. And so consistently between sites one, two, and three, the shallower site indicated in the blue line had a higher amplitude difference. This may be due to the fact that deeper sediments have more pressure on the grain structure, which causes a decrease in the in internal friction between the grains and reduces any attenuation of sound. So overall, uh, one can conclude that warmer environments are more susceptible to noise pollution, especially during the summer and spring when water temperature is higher. Um, depending on the grain size, environments with finer sand sediment absorb more sound and reflect less. And then sandy, deeper environments attenuate less and are more prone to noise pollution. So generally, activities that prove, um, and so, um, yeah, overall, All right, thank you, Nicole. It's really interesting. Uh, any questions for Nicole, please put in the chat. Uh, Nicole, can you remind me what were um, the like the noise pollution coming from vessels? Was that lower or higher frequency? Um, so it depends. Generally, it's lower frequencies. Okay. So that was, you mentioned, was less of an impact, the lower frequency noises, or did it have a higher impact? Uh, so, so lower frequencies have more of an impact because higher frequencies, um, since they can't travel as far, they're, like, they affect a smaller area, whereas larger frequencies um, can travel further and affect a larger area. Gotcha. Okay. So probably vessels on a sandy beach is probably pretty noisy underwater. Yes. Okay. <laughs> really interesting. Uh, uh, I'll kind of take one of the questions that was asked above. Do you have any plans to kind of get this information out and people uh, can be more aware of maybe where to drive vessels at certain times um, to prevent um, impact uh, on underwater sound, maybe on different marine life? Um, I feel like with, uh, with boats specifically, they could do more, they can have more technology trying to limit or um, like dampen the sound. Um, but, but as far as for environments, so like the sediment, different sediments, depending on their property, um, have different uh, capabilities of absorbing the sound. So like when planning where to place wind turbines, for example, you could put it in a, put it in a place where the environment was more, um, could handle the noise pollution better, such as the sediment. And then there's other factors, including like the depth, um, seasonal temperatures can also affect um, and salinity and other stuff like that, so. Interesting. All right, uh, a couple of questions in the chat. What recommendations, oh, sorry, we already asked that before. Uh, do you think that sound will deter organisms in areas like sedge to occupy them there? Um, do you think sound will deter organisms? Uh, to occupy them? Oh. oh. So I think like generally boats sounds would um, would probably scare away animals, but it depends on how strong, like what, what would be producing the sound and like how loud it is or how disruptive it is. Um, 
but yeah, I think if it's continuously playing, probably, but if it's like momentarily, they might come back. Mm -hmm. um, but studying animal behavior would be, would be a cool, interesting thing to study. That's a good point too. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. I do really like the next question, but I think I might save that question for everybody at the end who did these talks. Um, how'd you get interested in science? Um, we'll come back to that one. I think I really like that for, for everybody, but, um, uh, do you plan to see how certain organisms use that sound like croaker, um, will respond to sound in the different bottom types? Um, that could be a possible study. I'm not sure if I'm able to do that, but that would that would be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, study what the, the individual organisms, because they make sounds as well all the time. So it can be interesting to know that too. Um, all right, since Nicole, you're kind of, uh, you know, on the line right now, um, how did you first get interested in science? We'll kind of pitch that question to you and then we'll we'll kind of go backwards up the uh, chain. And uh, so, so how'd you get interested in it? Um, in general science, I think it was just, I was interested in STEM and so science and math kind of came together. But like for researching specifically my idea about noise pollution, um, I'm kind of like sensitive to noise where it annoys me or I can't focus in certain, um, when, when certain sounds play or like there's background noise. And so when I researched into it, um, marine animals, they're impacted way more by sound as they depend on it, like some depend on it to live. So um, when I looked more into it and saw like the urgency, um, I decided to work with this idea for my research. Personal connection with it. That's, that's really interesting. Great. Thank you, Nicole. Um, Cameron and Julia, same question for you. Um, how'd you get interested in science? And then also if you want to talk about how you got interested in your beach grass study um, topic specifically, um, that would be neat to hear from you. So I guess, Cameron, do you wanna go first? Sure. Uh, science in general, I'd probably have to agree with Nicole there. I've always been a, a fan. <laughs> um, it's, it's always been my favorite subject and then for dune grasses specifically, I think considering where we live um, and how the dunes actually do serve as a lot of protection for anyone who lives um, on Long Beach Island or even on the, on the coast of the bay, uh, it was pretty interesting since it's so topical to our daily lives. Okay, yeah, Juliet, do you have anything to add? Maybe how you got interested in science or a reason why you were interested in the beach grass specifically? Um, so it was really relevant, especially here because we're, we do live so close to the beach. And it was also really cool that the wind tunnel was also so close to us that we could like use it for all of um, the study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really neat that you guys were able to, to access that to do your, your research. Um, all right, uh, Shaylin, same questions for you. Um, for science in general, I just, I've, I've always liked marine animals, so I've always liked to look into that in that sort of aspect. But um, for my project individually, I, Actually, within my area, we use a lot of rock salt and it would just all go down the drain and I would see the white marks on the road. So I just wondered how that would affect an ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. I know a lot of people we discuss, you know, runoff and all the things that go along with runoff, but I feel like the salt is one of those um, things that maybe is not as well known. So that's kind of, that's, um, that's great that you decided to do your project on that. Um, Lana, same questions. Yeah, so um, I started participating in the science fair when I was really little in elementary school. And I continued that through middle school when I ran into this project where I um, tested how mealworms can actually uh, consume plastic um, due to a microorganism in their gut. 
So um, I chose that project because growing up by the Jersey Shore, you see a lot of plastic pollution along the road and especially on the beach. So um, I decided that I wanted, because I knew I'd be doing research for quite a long time, that I wanted um, my projects to actually have some sort of impact and be able to contribute to like a pool of knowledge on um, a topical issue. And so I settled on plastic pollution. So this is now, I'm now working on my seventh uh, project in that category. That's great. Yeah, I well, know at the reserve, we're very interested in marine debris, especially with plastics and how it in fact impacts the estuary. So um, yeah, another very relevant topic. All of your topics are so relevant. So that's so impressive that all of you um, have such great research ideas and uh, the methods that you went about to um, to study them are also very impressive. So great job, everyone. Keep up the great work. Um, uh, it looks like John went to put in the chat that if you have any recommendations for community-based research projects for students, um, send them to projectterrapin at gmail.com. Thank you, John, that's a good point. And uh, I think we have time for one more question um, for the panel. What challenges did you face either with the science aspects or the current state of COVID setbacks? That's a very good question. Um, does anyone wanna, wanna um, answer that? We don't have to necessarily go back in order, but whoever wants to go ahead and answer can take themselves off mute. Looks like Lana, go ahead. Yeah, I can start off. Um, it was basically the normal experimental process, you know, trial and error, um, adjusting what is going wrong because you always have a plan set up, but you really can never stick to that plan. There's always like things that pop up that make you have to change your methodology. And um, for me in particular, it was challenging with the, um, because creating the bioplastic, it was very trial and error as it didn't have a very solid background in organic chemistry. So that was probably um, the most challenging part because it did take nine months for me to uh, come up with that formula. Wow. And a lot of trials, Ooh. but um, with COVID, um, most of my research is done at home. I actually, um, I'm not reliant too heavily on um, outside organizations. Um, one thing that I did have problems with though was the tensile strength test for my plastic. Um, I would normally go to a laboratory um, that I made a connection with and see if they could um, help assist me in that process. But um, I created my own at home because um, we couldn't really go to the lab and go out at all during that time. Mm -hmm. Gotta get creative. <laughs> um, Shaylin, any uh, challenges uh, with um, uh, that you faced, and especially uh, during COVID? Um, like Lana said, a lot of trial and error. When I first tried to make my de-icing agent, de -icing agent, the cytosan acetic acid, I used the wrong proportions, and it came out like more of a slime than a liquid, <laughs> actually. Um, so yeah, a lot of trial and error with that. But in the state of COVID, a lot of my research is also done at home and I don't use any outside laboratories or anything. So I really haven't had that much of a problem with COVID. Okay. So that's good to know if you, you know, can work, work around it fairly easily. Um, Cameron, Juliet, any challenges? Um, in terms of COVID, we were lucky enough to be working in a pretty big uh, mostly outdoor space. So you didn't have too many issues since it was very easy to social distance and there was a lot of airflow. Um, in terms of uh, science challenges, we faced a lot of technical issues with um, the boxes not uh, fitting perfectly into the space where they were supposed to go. So we had a few uh, where we would have issues with sand falling through the cracks uh, or when we lifted the boxes up to weigh them, sand falling off. Uh, so we had to come up with solutions for those. Gotcha. Anything to add, Juliet? Um, well, like Cameron said, it, the wind tunnel is in basically this huge garage. So <laughs> it already has a lot of wind flow and um, it's pretty open. Right. Okay, and then Nicole, do you have anything that you wanted to share as far as challenges? Um, my when I went when I tested out into the field, it was like before COVID, so um, I think boating transportation out to Sedge uh, was helpful because uh, there was 
there's access from the school. Um, but like for, since Sedge wasn't open during the winter, I could only test during the summer. And so I had to test um, another location, uh, Pine Lake um, in the winter near my neighborhood. And during the winter it was like freezing cold. Um, <laughs> But yeah, yeah. So and it's touching the water is <laughs> so that alone is a challenge. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, great. Well, we are at time. Um, I know dismissal is pretty soon, so um, we'll let you guys go. Um, thank you once again for sharing all of your great projects. Uh, John, did you want to have any last words? Yeah, I want to thank the students, but thank everybody here for listening. You know, we have projects that. Um, we, we try to, you know, have some practical, you know, kind of outcomes with them. So they all, you know, have some connections to the local environment in some way. Um, and we are always glad to share them. And thank you for giving us this platform to share them. And, you know, we had our students working hard. And uh, it was also one of the challenges they have to face is presenting with a mask on because <laughs> we are in school. So we have to keep the mask on. So that makes it a lot more challenging. So hopefully it wasn't as challenging for you at home to hear because uh, <laughs> it is Not difficult sometimes to talk through the mass. So thank you, everybody. Stay safe. And we thank you, Caitlin. We thank the Tuckerton and Seaport and everybody at the Chakusto National History Research Reserve for letting us share this research. Thank you. Absolutely, John. Yeah. Well, thank you for uh, being with us here today. And um, yeah, again, if you have any questions, just send us, I'll, I'll put my email in the chat, but otherwise, uh, enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Take care, have a good one.